Well, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming out. Um, this is a, a pretty exciting movie for sound, and so you're in for a real treat tonight. But it's not going to come from me. It's actually going to come from the people who worked on it. So I'm going to ask them all to come up on stage, and I'll introduce you guys when you come sit down. So this is a group of people who worked on the sound for our Tron Legacy. So come on up. <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, Hi, Phil. First, we have Steve Bodeker, who is a sound designer on the film. We have Gwen Whittle, who is a supervising sound editor. We have Gary Rizzo, who was the re-recording mixer, handling both music and dialogue. And our supporting team, the picture editor, Jim Haygood. <laughs> We never get to say that it's backwards, actually. Um, <laughs> and music supervisor Jason Bendley. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to be just the driver. Go, Phil. <laughs> so, uh, God, it had to be about more than three years ago. We were contacted up at Skywalker about working on a teaser trailer. But it was a slightly different teaser trailer in that we weren't really clear that it was even going to play for the public. Um, it was a test for a new version of Tron, and it really only played mainly for Disney sort of staff and executive people, and it played one time at Comic-Con, but we thought maybe we'd just start off by playing that for you guys tonight, since you'll probably be the only audience who's really got a chance to check it out. It's never been played in a theater like this with a sound system like this before, so uh, why don't you give a listen, because this kind of gives you a sense of like what got the whole Tron legacy story started. Yeah. We're shaking the lights on that. So who was that, who was that made 
Well, it ended up being made as a sort of a test for the executives to see how it would play, how the technology would work, and um, and uh, Joseph Kaczynski was brought on to do it. He had a background with doing commercials and a lot of work with things like this. Um, imagine my surprise when I see this thing. I'm thinking, oh, wow, Tron, this is going to be cool. This is so cool and different than what I was expecting. Um, and of course, the two main things for sound design that we had to really focus on were the bikes and the disc at the end. There's all those other sounds, but those were the two kind of key elements that we really had to focus on and try to define what they sounded like. Um, and I was just like, wow, this is like, this is a blast. So I would have conversations with Joe and try and talk about, okay, how are we gonna do this? What do we want this to sound like? And I was sort of thinking in terms of kind of updating the approach to, from the original Tron and kind of using like the latest technology, the newer synthesizers, the newer plugins to make a really sci-fi sounding motorcycle and kind of recreate a motorcycle from scratch. Um, and it was working and it was really cool, but, but they ended up being really smooth and clean and it didn't really have the kind of grit that we were looking for. And I would show it to Joe and he kind of felt the same way. And what I ended up trying was to approach it from the other angle, instead of making sort of synthetic um, sounds to sound like motorcycles, I tried to make motorcycles sound really futuristic and different. So we ended up getting these Ducati recordings and I would just do radical, radical pitch manipulation to them so that as the Dopplers went by, they were like, went from really high to really low. Uh, and I did this thing called resonant sweeping where you take the resonant pitches, it's kind of like, um, sort of inspired by what DJs will do. When a DJ sort of sweeps out of a song, sometimes it'll be that and if you do that and follow the pitch of the motorcycle going by, it turns out it makes it sound like it's got this really high-tech whine to it. So I started adding those to the bikes and showed it to Joe, and he's like, oh, that's cool, that's cool. And we had a big conversation, actually, about it, um, about the idea that, well, video games have sort of evolved. They're not just these synthetic sounds anymore. In some ways, in a lot of video games, they're more complex than movies. So let's try that other angle, and that's kind of where we ended up with the bikes. They just got sort of bigger, they got rougher, they got faster. And once we had that established, we had kind of two different approaches at the same time. The very sort of synthetic that I started with, and then the very kind of motorcycle-y. And we were able to kind of blend them as we went through and pick what was the most effective for what buy. Um, what I found was really cool about that is once we got something that sort of was believable, then it could really have fun. And so you start doing things like Another thing that I kind of ripped off from sort of the DJ kind of idea is what I call a dive bomb, where I made this low end sound that just goes boom, and it just goes down. And I just put it wherever it seemed cool. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, it sort of worked. And it was like, like, one of the things that I really liked that Phil was actually commenting on earlier is that when the bike sort of stops at the end, you can hear a couple of those things together. The dive bomb obviously is there, because that's fun. And then the resonant sweep thing that I was doing on the bike. So as the bike slows, I was following the pitch with this pitch sweep. But the bike kept slowing and slowing and slowing because, of course, it's stopping. And I kept following the sweep down. And it got to the point where it was doing something oh so wrong. <laughs> it was sort of feeding back on itself. But it was kind of cool. So we just sort of left it and went with it. So anyway, that was sort of where we started with this thing. And Played it for the, the, the executives played it. I guess they liked it enough to play it at Comic-Con. People sort of reacted, I guess, pretty positively. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit. Majorly. Well, What's fair to say, the movie wasn't, is, Jim, is it fair to say the movie wasn't officially a movie at this point, right? Oh, no, not at all. I mean, it was what got it off the ground. And that's why Joe always kind of felt that, you know, the Hall H Comic-Con crowd was really what made the movie get off, you know, the enthusiasm to this being played was what got it off the ground. I was just going to point out one thing, too. You know, Steve had worked at that early stage, so in terms of editorial, he had already worked a lot on different sounds and created a lot of elements and things like that. So during the, during the cut, we had all this kind of library of, of uh, sounds that had been created so early in the process. It was really, you know... Instead of just pulling stuff off Hollywood Edge, you know, for the whole process, you know, <laughs> we had some, you know, nice stuff to work with. The Tron edition, Hollywood. 
And a very small crew worked on this, right? The total, in terms of sound people, how many people were involved with the making of uh, We had, the Foley people did a half a day just to get all the stuff at the end. And actually there's like a really cool sound in that that we ended up holding on to, the, the, sort of, the sort of skidding sound. If you listen later, some of the stuff we're gonna play, you'll get to check it out. But they did a lot of the glass stuff, very precise, clean kind of walking and things. And I did the, the bikes and the sort of sound design, sound effects stuff. Um, uh, Chris Boys mixed all the sound design and just, it was just crazy because he took it from something that I thought was like really cool and just jammed it up to this whole other level that's shaking the lights in here. Uh, and Gary came on and was mixing and, and uh, doing some dialogue and music. Um, and at that point, once it kind of got going, all of a sudden we were in movie mode. So it was like, <laughs> we're not thinking about this teaser anymore. Uh, we're thinking about, they went off to start shooting. They started getting the visual effects for the actual movie. Um, and I guess there started to be some rumors of music going around. That's a, that's Anybody? a segue to you, Jason. <laughs> sure. So, so what were the early conversations about music in Tron? Um, were well, uh, at this it, point? You know, at the time of, of this teaser, um, Daft Punk had not been brought on yet. Uh, we worked with some freelance composers. There was a lot of discussion on the role of music. And um, I had uh, already been working with Joe in advertising for a few years, three or four years at that point. And I knew he had a very keen ear for music, which is a great advantage in a director. And he had a very specific vision for this. And I think the, the, the key that you'll notice is, is musically that passage uh, evolves from the acoustic to the electronic. And that, that was really the statement he wanted to make on a, a, a subtle level. Um, he wanted to let the sound design uh, have its, its, uh, its space and... Um, I think it was an idea of doing something minimal that had um, more impact, less being more. Um, <clears throat> also early on, once uh, Daft Punk did come into uh, the conversation, we met with Steve. Um, and once again, you know, Joe really set the stage for uh, us to open the lines of communication and uh, start you know, working on ideas. This was very, very early in the process. And so, um, when they started shooting the film, um, tr Daft Punk was a notion, I suppose. But or, or oh no, they had yeah, they were on by that time oh, they uh, were. when they when when it was shot. Uh, just at this point with the teaser, they were not on. Uh, but you know, just to continue with uh, Daft Punk and their role, um, it took about a year of courtship to, to get them to commit uh, to the, the project. Uh, once they committed, uh, they fully dedicated themselves to this, uh, really uh, blocking off you know, two years. Um, I think it was a leap of faith for, for everyone, um, the studio and, and for Daft Punk, but they didn't have a, a whole lot of experience, you know, any experience really. Tomas had worked on a, on a French indie film called uh, Irreversible, which is a very difficult film to watch if you've seen it. It's like, <laughs> I couldn't watch the whole thing. But anyway, um, you know, when they came in, they brought all of these uh, demos, uh, th these wonderful ideas. And so there was never a temp uh, in, in the process. It was always Daft Punk ideas that they handed over to Jim and to uh, Joe Kosinski, and they would cut it up and assign it to different scenes and different characters, and, and so these musical ideas would evolve with, with the picture. Um, also, the great advantage of having these demos to play on set was uh, terrific. Um, it helped uh, inform uh, the actors about a certain tone, uh, mood of a scene, um, tempo, so it was really helpful, and totally unique. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, a composer isn't typically on board until much, much later in the process. I have a question for you. Did he ever consider anyone besides Daft Punk? Yes. Um, yeah, we had a short list, but uh, Daft Punk were far and away the number one. Uh, and so we really kept the faith and uh, really tried to make that happen. But um, Joe loves, he loves a lot of electronic music He's a real music guy. Uh, I mean, his background, you know, 
He's a music guy. So it, it was a real advantage, you know, working with him as a music supervisor's dream come true because there were a lot of situations in our review sessions where Joe would be the first person to notice something had changed uh, sooner than I would or, or Daft Punk would know. And then we'd go back and review and we'd say, oh, oh, you're, you're right, you're right. So um, someone with that keen an ear is, is really uh, great to work with. Well, they started shooting. Gwen. <laughs> yes. So they had, that's great teaser, they had these fantastic sound effects, they've got great music, so then they started shooting. So they had to have great costumes, and part of these great costumes had these beautiful lights that went in them. And what, you want me to hold this one? Right. Take two of them. <laughs> um, so these suits had these beautiful lights which illuminated the characters so that they, the light would bounce off the other one and they'd look great. But these lights had this wine that had this, he, he added wine, we, we, we got this horrible, he got like, you know, grade A French wine. We got this horrible, I don't know. Migraine. Strawberry Hills Boone's Farm wine. Um, <laughs> and it was, it was horrible. And even, Jim, you can tell us, even trying to cut this stuff, a picture editor, you'd get a migraine just even listening to it for two seconds. So we knew we had to do something even for the picture editors before we got to sort of the end post thing. And um, we did this kind of blanket I think it was a cedar box thing. I mean, you were kind of involved with that, wasn't thing. it? Yeah. yeah. And we just kind of took everything, just whomped it through it. But it made it sound a little bit underwater and a little bit washy. So we knew we couldn't use that for the final product. So we um, instead, we, we had this lady named Marie Ebbing, and she did this process called Nova on it. And just kind of, if you take sound and make it a pretty picture, she could take the color of this exact wine out. But we will play you a little bit of wine, and you can hear what we had to deal with. <laughs> You guys have to remember, this is like panicked phone call from the producer yeah. like a week into the shoot. Well, so somehow they'd started shooting and discovered this on set. E even Jeff Bridges, you can hear me now take it. Are you hearing this? <laughs> yeah, because you could, you could hear it on yeah. set, and so it was driving the actors nuts. Yeah. It was really an unpleasant yeah. discovery. Pay attention when you're watch, when you're listening to it to how it changes, because that's part of why, it, why it's such a kind of a difficult Because as the thing. actors move close to each other, like if I move to Gary, go, Wee! And they're different, pit like Cora would have a certain pitch on some scenes that all be different. Let's play complex. the clip. It's probably good to show the example. Here you go. You don't want me to Let's act it out? <laughs> us. How can he be so afraid of his own creation? I mean, he built Clue. Why doesn't he just end him? He could, but it would require reintegration. Yeah, all right. Flynn would never survive the event. It would mean the end of them both. If he refuses to save himself, then I will. How? I'm going through the portal. Who wants Flynn's disc? Not mine. I'm going to find out and we're going to figure this thing out from the other side. This may be Clue's game here, but in my world, he's gone in one keystroke. But I can't do anything unless I get to the portal. And my guts tell me that you don't want to be stuck in this place for eternity either. I really think you should consider your father's wisdom. I am. how well the Nova process worked and Gary Rizzo's fantastic dialogue mixing worked and how we cleaned it up. Okay, so we'll play. You want to play the next one? Just play the next one? Okay. Yeah. Like, sorry. <laughs> how can he be so afraid of his own creation? I mean, he built Clue. Why doesn't he just end him? He could, but it would require reintegration. Yeah, all right. Flynn would never survive the event. It would mean the end of them both. If he refuses to save himself, then I will. How? I'm going through the portal. Who wants Flynn's disc? Not mine. I'm going to find out, and we're going to figure this thing out from the other side. This may be Clue's game here, but in my world, he's gone in one keystroke. But I can't do anything unless I get to the portal. 
And my gut's telling me that you don't want to be stuck in this place for eternity either. I really think you should consider your father's wisdom. I have. So what's kind of cool about what the Nova process did is it took the wine out, but it left the voice quality alone, and it didn't affect the way they sounded. So. Uh, yeah, the other complexity on top of all that is that they're whispering. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. They're whispering <laughs> through all that. So, um, yeah, with the wine, and then, of course, when you're whispering, the signal-to-noise ratio is kind of rough to deal with. So, um, you know, the low-level recordings, basically, that we had to maximize. So the next part of this is the context, is the sound effects, the ambiences, the rest of the final mix that, to some degree, we, you know, we use, we leaned into, we hid behind, to some degree, to hide some of the, the bits and the bumps that are, that are in that track. Because when you listen to the dialogue premix, what you just heard, you could still hear backgrounds coming and going, and this is where the effects really kind of helped us out a lot. Well, that example, too, kind of sounded like there was really a primary pitch, but it, in, in a lot of cases it was spread all over the place, where there'd be low frequency stuff and just all kinds of harmonics. I mean, you'd see when I was using the plug-in on the Avid, you know, and it would kind of display, and you would just see just peaks all over the place. So how they're able to get that out and keep that voice sounding like a human is amazing. Right, and also that the Nova stuff was, was probably effective what did I say, 85% of the time? Yeah, it couldn't handle wind. It couldn't handle the, the broader band it was, obviously, the worse it was. I mean, it helped. in some ways it helped that the wine was, even though it changed a lot, it was still pretty specific, so they could kind of surgically remove it. But the workflow was set up so that it was efficient for our purposes in that it was cut with the wine as the dialogue editors would have cut it, and then it was delivered to Marie right. to run through. Renovator, I think is the, the full name of the, the process. So. Um, and I think they use it on a pyramid system. Is dialogue editors deserve medals of, of something to have cut all that stuff without a lot, losing their minds. But for the clips that didn't work through Renovator, we certainly had the original edit of the original track that we were able to get to, and for the 15 to 20 percent of the time that we needed it, it was easily accessible to get, and we would use that at the dialogue pre dub process. But even that wasn't completely perfect, so we did, to some degree, hide behind a lot of the ambiences, and we used the mix as a good team comes together, <laughs> the whole thing, <laughs> we hid behind the sound effects as we needed to. So, uh, but we have that example, so let's play yes. the next clip. <laughs> yeah, this, is the, this is the final mix, this is everything. Of that content. same clip. Uh, for that same clip. Thing. So let's play it. How can he be so afraid of his own creation? I mean, he built Clue, why doesn't he just end him? He could, but it would require reintegration. Yeah, all right. Flynn would never survive the event. It would mean the end of them both. If he refuses to save himself, then I will. How? I'm going through the portal. Who wants Flynn's death? Not mine. I'm gonna find out, and we're gonna figure this thing out from the other side. This may be Clue's game here, but in my world, he's gone in one keystroke. But I can't do anything unless I get to the portal. And my gut's telling me that you don't want to be stuck in this place for eternity either. I really think you should consider your father's wisdom. I am. The, the producer was applauding because um, I think they were panicked because they couldn't cut the movie. It was impossible for Jim to cut it. And they were terrified that they would have to replace all that dialogue. I think what's amazing is that's all the original production sound, right? Well, there are a couple alts and production alts in there, but it's all production. So that's all stuff that was recorded on set with the yeah. wine. So I think the... Garrett's exhale right at the end. That, was an, that was an ADR exhale, actually. <laughs> it's true. Okay. But that was added, so but it's different. It. <laughs> okay. So the other thing that was kind of a challenge um, production-wise is that Jeff Bridges had this fake head. And we can... <laughs> wait, wait, what do you mean by yeah, fake head? Yeah, you head? have to be a little bit more specific when you say that. <laughs> um, 
a, a stand-in head, I guess, because oh. it was probably more to the point. And well, Jim, maybe you can talk more about the, the way you worked around the stand-in head and all that kind of like stuff. Like, how did you photograph it when he was Clue? That's kind of the question, really. I mean, the, the visual effects part of it? Yeah. Well, yeah, because he was on his little, his little square that we got, and then you had the sock head guy. Yeah, well, they, they kind of... Jeff wanted to be able to drive the performance, kind of as opposed to the Benjamin Button approach, where an act, uh, kind of the stand-in did the scene, and then Brad came in later and kind of acted to the stand-in, and Jeff wanted to drive it that himself. And so they uh, would shoot, he would walk through with the kind of various kind of headgear to kind of record his facial stuff and walk through and do the scene and block it out and get that worked out. And the stand in uh, would uh, watch that performance. And then he'd come through and memorize that and do as close as he could the same thing. And then we would, after the fact, go in and cut in Jeff's performance to kind of match that body movement. So you want to play? Yeah, this, so, so like? you'll see an example of what we had to work with um, in the beginning, the very but you'll see it. Self-explanatory. You are a very rare bird, aren't you? Where's your disc? Where is he? You must have been so lonely out there. Tragic to be the only one. I've seen what users are capable of, Clue. You don't belong with them. I have something very special in mind for you. Take her upstairs and find them. You'll have to excuse me, you arrived just as I was preparing a little toast. Jim, yeah. what were you going to say? I was just going to say the irony is that even on the, the head cam stuff, there's still bad sound. So, so where was he? And there's just no excuse. I mean, there'd be fans going during the head cam recording and or like... Yeah, so where was that he? That at least should have been clean. And, Physically, and it where, wasn't. where was he? Like, when we see that shot... He would walk through the, on, on the same set. Like, he's actually, that little head in set is him walking through that same set. Oh, okay. But since the camera's mounted to him, it's just this locked-off shot of his head. And could she hear that dialogue in an earpiece, or... or she uh, to no, she would, she would do it with Jeff, and then she would do it with Reardon, the oh. guy, you know, the, the stand-in. And they would kind of do it as close as possible to the same performance. So obviously we had to take care of the wines on that. And the other thing that was um, the, the fake, the, uh, it's not a fake head, whatever, whatever, we, whatever we call it, that ca the visual effects for that came in late. So we had to definitely keep tweaking the sync on those things the whole way through. But you can watch the final version of that okay. and see how pretty it looks. Let's play it. You are a very rare bird, aren't you? Where's your disc? Where is he? Must have been so lonely out there. Tragic to be the only one. I've seen what users are capable of, Clue. You don't belong with them. I have something very special in mind for you. Take her upstairs and find them. You'll have to excuse me, you arrived just as I was preparing a little toast. One other thing I forgot to say about that clip, which is kind of cool, is that Steve Boddicker took those crowds, which was maybe about 20 people, made them sound like 200. <laughs> so That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is kind of like a, an interesting kind of conundrum you're in, which is that you have this kind of technical problem on set that kind of makes it difficult to tell this kind of human story. But then we have this story that takes place in a synthetic world. 
Sure. The whole thing happens on the grid. <laughs> and on the grid, there's, um, to some degree, there's a, a hierarchy of people that are on the grid. And they're not even people. They are programs. All these programs um, have their own special sound. Um, and when we had to do some dialogue processing to kind of sell the concept of these programs and, and how they exist and where they are within this hierarchy. And the concept really was that kind of lower on the totem pole you are, the more heavily processed your dialogue would be. So um, the farther away you are from human. Yeah, right? yeah. Human being the top. And the closer you are to human, the, the less processing. And, and in terms of the processing and what we would do, there really were no rules. Um, we would just experiment um, in a variety of different stages. And I'll say a good chunk of it would happen during the editorial stage. Um, and then we would carry the, the, the bits that worked for it. And then if we changed our mind and we didn't feel like something was working as well, we would um, do it on the dub stage and we would come up with a different idea. Um, it was kind of a nice marriage between the effects department and the dialogue department too because the effects did some of the processing and then we did some of it and you did some of it, I did some of it, mm -hmm. so kind of was cross, cross pollinated. It was good teamwork. Yeah. Was, there, was there, a, I guess I remember in the movie that basically the, the programs were basically bad guys. Is it fair to say generally speaking? Some of them are. So, okay. I just, anytime you heard it more synthetic, did that mean that the audience was supposed to think that they were more bad guys or good guys, I, bad guys? I don't know, Jim, what do you think? Uh, no, it was just hierarchy. Just hierarchy. They could be good or bad. Okay. <laughs> so we'll play. Uh, we'll, let's play, play the first clip. Yeah, the first let's one? play the first one. Okay. We're doing them one at a time. Yes. We can. Or, or do you want? Are we doing the whatever whole you guys want? Let's play the first one. Here's okay. the first one. We're gonna play before and after, so you can hear the original recording before it was processed, and then once it got processed. Here we go. This program has no disc. Another stray. This program has no disc. Another spray. Hey, wait. That's a sentry guard at work. <laughs> so how much of that was editorial, uh, sound, uh, like a uh, sound effects editor, dialogue editor processing, and how much of it was in the mix? That particular one happened pretty early on. Yeah, that was mostly an editorial. It was a combination of, of Josh Gold and, and me a little bit, I think. And, and Jim, did they send process stuff for you guys to cut picture with, or was this stuff that you just discovered that we dealt with at the end? I'm trying to remember. We may have had some. We we definitely sent you stuff early on because we wanted Joe to approve, make sure we were going in the right direction. So yeah, we may have had some in some yeah. of those Addison mixes. We might have had some of those elements. This next clip is a particularly good one because um, the the program that speaks is pretty low on the totem pole, and um, we really cut together a, a hybrid of a variety of different processes to come up with what is actually in the movie. But let's just play the clip and uh, let there's, it work. There's several it. passes, so we'll play it. Here we go. Keep quiet if you want to live. Keep quiet if you want to live. Keep quiet if you want to live. He is a bit part, but uh, he's letting uh, letting our friend Sam know that He's in big trouble. One thing that's kind of cool about that piece is because when, because they're in the computer world and you can make stuff sound unnatural, you could take that horrible production recording where you could hardly hear them at all and you could just tweak the crap out of it and it didn't matter because you, it could get all distorted and digitized and everything and that was okay. Sure, distortion became an element that was a it tool. It helped us. <laughs> <laughs> didn't, didn't, didn't Joe have like a real kind of affection for distortion? Oh, he loves distortion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, of all well, it was something to be embraced, yeah. and, and um, whether it was in a production track and, and it was something that he just believed was um, inherent to, you know, the, uh, the natural quality of the track or whether it was something that we had induced, it was a quality that he felt seemed to somehow have a natural feel to it. Um, um, moving into the sirens... Um, we have one primary character named Jem, who is one of the sirens, that um, they certainly have a, a different vibe. They're not distorted. They have a very different, smooth, phasey, flangey feel to them. Gem, this one isn't Jem, but this is one of the different right. sirens, which has a peculiar sound to it, so we figured we'd play it as an example. He's different. He's different. The sirens, of course... Um, I, for those that have seen the movie, they kind of have this very particular way that they move, and we figured they should have a particular way that they sound, and we figured that they uniquely should have the, the phase flange process that was, um, I don't know, pretty slick. 
for for their the role that and the responsibilities that they have on the grid and where they fall on the hierarchy. And the wine didn't matter in that. The case. wine didn't really matter at that point. <laughs> Again, because we we tweaked it so much that yes. it didn't it didn't matter. I just put it in the light bike. <laughs> <laughs> and the lightning that we hide behind. Right. <laughs> um, uh, at the other end of the spectrum, we have some of our um, Disc Wars opponents, and some of our opponents are pretty monstrous. Um, and we'll. Let's just play this example here. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Yeah, so you put the <laughs> heavy sound effects in to kind of help him out, and he becomes pretty frightening. Reverb's Ooh. your friend, too. Yeah. <laughs> We so love reverb. sound effects add an element, or is it just a, a thing in the mix, a low-end thing? You know well, it's, it just so happened that when that disc comes on, it kind of has that low subwoofer element. It kind of supported that growl at that moment, and that was just something that nicely kind of came together. That happened a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it did. In the sense that like, there was a lot of things coming from different directions, and it was sort of like a band kind of jamming. It definitely was like that. No, and that was kind of the fun part about doing this mix, I think. Everybody kind of had their responsibilities and had their roles that they had to play, but there was a really cool synergy where things kind of came together. Um, that was, for me, i got to say, that was part of the fun of this mix. Um, it, this whole this processing stuff, um, it was going to be playing, in many cases, with, with the Daft Punk music. And the Daft Punk music is all synthetic too. Was there ever any kind of concern about just kind of the kind of processing games that you guys were doing and how it would sit with the music and knowing what they did? Or it was all just like whatever sounded good was fine? Yeah, I have to say there were, I think there might have been a couple of examples where we had to change the processing based upon not necessarily the music, but the other elements that it was playing against. Um, the one that comes to mind are the, the two guys that jump on their bikes. Um. We also had to make sure we didn't lose clarity. Even though the people were really low on the totem pole, if they were too processed, you couldn't understand what they were saying. So that was another kind of thing we had to deal with. All part of the balancing act. Yeah. But when they die... When they die, it's different. When they die. Let's talk about dying on the grid. They don't really die because they're not really people. They're programs. So when a program dies, what happens? What do we call that? We call that... D-Rez. This is the king of D-Rez. The king of D-Rez. Aren't you embarrassed saying it that way? D-Resolution. Our friend Vicky says that a couple times in the movie. D-Resolution. Um... Yeah, so we have an example of de-resolution. Um, we have a couple of examples of de-resolution, actually, to show. The first one really is, um, I think, one of the best examples of de-res, because not only is it uh, a de-res, but it happens de-res in a time warp, which is, I don't know, that just let, gets let, me giddy. Let, let him see him, then he can be, yeah, 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 it's cool. <laughs> But the original is beautiful. This is the first pass. Listen to the, listen to the beginning. This is the evolution <laughs> of the D-Res okay. time warp. Here we go. So it turns into a digital breakup. We really uh, begin to get into distortion, and then we start getting into some hash elements, and then literally it starts cutting out and breaking up and falling apart. But it's not enough. There's no. still more. No, it's not <laughs> nearly enough. What's also cool about this next bit is it happened on one of the last days of the final mix. We got, oh, we should do that. And it was really cool. It was Josh Gold again. Yeah, go Josh. We'll play it and you'll tell us what he did. Okay. Yeah! So what was that? <laughs> what was that? That's time expansion. I mean, it's, no, it, uh, was some, it was some. It was some sound toys plug-in thing that he likes. I don't know the sound of a, a tape machine slowing down. Slowing down yeah. basically right. as the time warps and as he begins to break. But what really helps the D-Res, in my opinion, are the sound effects and the Foley elements. There's certainly there's a wonderful Foley element that is sounds like a million metal Scrabble pieces falling onto the floor all at once. It's actually very wonderful. We have the composite mix to play next. Is that Let, true? Let's do it. Here we go. And that's what happens when you get D-Res. <laughs> that's actually a really good example, again, like we were talking about, of 
the band kind of jamming because yeah. early on we did some tests with de-resing, not the people, but just like the explosions de-resing and the bikes de-resing as they fell apart. And what I found was that as long as something had a sound, we could actually do the sonic equivalent to what you're seeing. And I talked to Joe about it. It's like, we should try and have these guys scream whenever they die or de-res. Uh, and that would give us something to play with. And we found a process um, with some plugins where it just sort of particleizes all of the little voice elements. So as they're screaming, it's, you slowly kind of automate in this thing that just, it's called shuffle, and it just particleizes them. Uh, and then towards the end of it, you just add this weird little crispy thing called sci-fi that makes it sound really, really small. So that was a process that we came up with that then got passed on. They started doing it with the dialogue. Then someone had an idea to push it down. And then, I mean, this thing is composed of like almost every department in the movie. And then the foley little, the foley little bits just kind of add to the D-res. So it all kind of came together. There yeah, was wonderful. also, I don't know if you wanted to mention too, uh, the, uh, the Hall H crowd. That, that, that's later. Coming. Oh, it's That's coming? Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll play a couple more of these. How's, well, let's talk about Jarvis. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Jarvis is the, he's the, the last d example here. Yeah. Jarvis is, uh, is he, would you call him a primary character? He's a secondary character. He's kind of a lackey. Yeah. Um, his processing is relatively simple, re relatively subtle. It's more of an octave treatment that kind of sits underneath him as he's talking. Um, but we, uh, we, we put in the example here of his d -res. Because he is a program to his demise. Also, he's not screaming; he's actually derezzed mid-speech. Let's play it. Death to the user. Death to the user. So there's one more derez. Even the background guys get derez in addition to primary characters and secondary characters through our movie. So there's one example we want to show of a of a background guy who gets derezzed. Let's play it. You want to just play it? <laughs> so of course, no sci-fi film would be complete without the use of a particular sound element. Phil, why don't you just go ahead and play hey guys, the original source so of that. Know what this is. Here we go. <laughs> we'll own it. We did it. So uh, I was just going to say, but we didn't do it. Somebody <laughs> yes, else we did. So uh, I can't see people raise their hands. Is there anyone who doesn't know what that is? Yep, there's I at least can't one. Tell. Is there, there's somebody that doesn't know what that sound is? All right. Do we want to just yeah, it, it's called the Wilhelm. Um, for it's kind of a uh, an in joke among sound editors, and it was actually something that was used in early in westerns. Yeah. I think it came, originally came out of the Warner Brothers library. It was a um, man being eaten by alligator, <laughs> <laughs> recorded in the '40s at some point. And and as as lore goes, Ben Bird, the sound designer on the Star Wars films, kind of championed the sound and started putting it in Star Wars movies and his colleagues started putting it in other movies, and this sound's probably been in at least Hundreds. 50. Hundreds? Okay. Hundreds. Go to YouTube and search for Wilhelm, and you'll see a compilation. But, here, but we de it. Up. Here's it again, right? de -rest. Just so you appreciate it. No one else has done this before. Here we go. <laughs> there you go. A little trivia go. for you. Bye-bye. <laughs> We have a lot of fun doing this stuff, by the way. <laughs> no, we don't. Not at all. <laughs> well, so while all of that stuff is going on, these guys are getting rid of noise. They're doing all this de-resing. They're doing all this crazy vocal processing. Um, the film is still being shot. Things are being edited together. Music is sort of being written. The visual effects keep moving along. So what we had to do is sort of take some of the ideas that we really liked from that original teaser that you saw and kind of apply them and kind of have them grow to fill a movie, which is slightly different than a three-minute teaser. Um, one of the other elements from that teaser that was really critical but was very short was the disc sounds. Um, I created some disc sounds for that were basically these tones. Um, I was concerned that the discs, they need to sound dangerous, they sort of need to sound electric, they need to have like an energy to them, but you needed to be able to throw them. So they couldn't really sound like the person catching it would have his arm derezzed. Um, but they had to kind of be dangerous. So 
To me, the real trick with it was to try to make sure that there was a tone to it and that the tone had a kind of a pulse, and that kind of would give it an energy. The tone would allow it to sort of you hear the Doppler of it going by. And so we started working on some of those things and uh, providing stuff for them to use in the Avid. So I think this next thing is, is just a stereo thing from what we had sent them for the Avid. So this very early sketch that was sent to the picture. And you can part. see some of the, the type of stuff that we were working to. It's, you really have to use your imagination um, not only as you're coming up with these sounds, but also imagining what you're going to be seeing. So here, let's play it. So that, that you can hear the disc, it's the same kind of type of disc sound from the teaser, but uh, we obviously had to make a lot more of it. It had to be a lot more energized, a lot more active. Uh, and what I ended up doing with it, um, for one thing, Joe really wanted it to sound more dangerous. So again, I kind of turned to that resonator thing that I was talking about before, where I was able to pitch just these minute, very sharp sounding frequencies that kind of brought up a sharpness to it without actually having to add metal blades or something like that. Um, uh, but then the really kind of almost embarrassingly fun thing to do was it needed to have a sense of movement. And so I would play this, the tone and the sound back over the speakers in my design room and kind of like a combination of the Tron guy and the Star Wars kid. I had a microphone in my hand and I was just waving it in front of the speaker, just kind of giving all this sort of natural acoustic movement to it. And that sort of became the basis for the sound of the disc. Now, add to that the band element. We have Chris Boys also was doing a bunch of sound design for things, and as he was mixing, he was adding ideas. Uh, as you start to get these discs flying around, um, you have a lot of opportunities once you've designed a sound to, to sweeten it and to kind of make it more exciting. And so we started adding more and more elements uh, and kind of trying to elevate it to another level. And I think now we have where we ended up. So this is first going to be just the sound effects, uh, I believe. Um, and then we'll play the entire mix. So let's play just the sound effects from the final. Here we go. in here to the final mix actually so you can hear it with everything else Evolved for sure, um, and I would say that's like, like we were talking about before. The whole gang. This is definitely one of those collaborative type moments. It just kept evolving and changing and growing. And whenever something sort of was working in one section, like oh, that was a kind of a cool thing. Let's try it down here, uh, and that helped a lot. Especially we start getting the music in there. Some things work with the music. Some things you want to sort of change so that you're clear of the music. And it was pretty fun. It was a lot of fun. It okay, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, the, the next thing I, I'd, I'd love to talk about is, um, is the idea of the magnitude of the arena uh, and some of the, the size of the spaces that we're trying to sell in this movie, the, the arena specifically. Um, and there's a couple different aspects to it. You heard a little bit of um, our announcer, Vicky, the female voice that's kind of um, talking us through Disc Wars, and she shows up at a couple different places through the movie. But um, one of the elements that we would use to help sell space was, uh, fortunately, we were mixing in 7.1 for this movie. So we had an extra set of stereo surround speakers, and um, we would use a variety of different discrete reverbs and discrete delays to kind of sell the slapbacks and the repeats of what would happen in a huge stadium environment. 
Um, and when she talks and she's kind of narrating through the whole thing um, and it resonates and uh, you kind of as an audience member hear her as Sam is hearing her, it almost kind of puts you in the arena of the discourse itself. Adding to that, we did this great recording, and I didn't do it, I'm not gonna take credit for it, but we, um, <laughs> we did this great thing where at um, the last Comic-Con um, convention, yeah, were you, you were there for that, weren't yep. you? Where um, we actually had uh, some help from our crew. They were actually there with their recording rigs, and we would get that crew of how many people was it? 5,000? 7,000. 7,000 people in Hall H, which is a huge space. Um, there were particular chants that we needed from an enormous group. Um, certain things like disc wars, disc wars, that chant that um, in order to get it to sound as realistic as possible, we wanted to get the real thing. Well, just uh, during the, the <coughs> cutting, um, we were trying to tempt these crowds in. And, you know, you're drawing from libraries and it's always kind of sports arenas and you've got different people whistling and all this kind of stuff that you can't use. And so we knew that somehow for the final we were going to have to be able to have some nice big crowds that were clean. And it's and, really hard to get 7,000 loop groupers. In and it's room. really <laughs> tough to do. I mean, you always think, oh, we can go to some event and try and arrange it, but it's, you know, if you're not really in control of the event, it's hard to, hard to get but good But Comic-Con was a captured audience. They were there uh, yeah, to loyal. see. Yeah, they were there to see some of the marketing that was going on for this film that was coming out. They were amped. They were stoked. They were told they were going to be in the movie. They were ready. They were ready to do it. So how many different chants do you think they did for that? Um, I don't know. I just put to cut together a, a text because I knew I didn't want Joe standing up there saying, okay, do this, because then you'd be hearing his voice in the recordings. And so we cut together just a, a text thing that led them through different, we kind of had a bouncing ball type of deal to kind of get them to do these different things and initiate laughter. There was one point where we kind of set, set up that there was something really important that was going to come on the screen and for them to wait, and, and it just popped up a big shot of Tron guy, and they all started laughing, and that's how we got one of our laughs that we, that we used. They were incredibly obedient when they said silence. Like they, they just stopped instantly. <laughs> they wanted to be in the movie. They, they wanted to do what they were told. It's the uh, second time we mentioned Tron Guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that said, this next clip that we're going to show you kind of is, um, I don't know, peeling back the layers of the onion to show you some of the layers of the mix. This is as um, Sam is coming up through the elevator shaft, and he's experiencing the arena for the very first time. Um, it starts off with just sound effects, um, and, and the Foley, and then we introduce the music element to kind of give you the sonic adrenaline that kind, of, uh, that kind of goes with it, and then you'll hear Vicky's voice, our announcer's voice, kind of resonate through the arena, and then you'll hear the Comic-Con crowd. There was a loop group crowd that was recorded for it, but Joe by far preferred... He loved his Comic-Con crowd. ...the real Comic-Con <laughs> crowd. The Who wouldn't like 7,000 people cheering for their movie? Cheering for Joe, yeah. <laughs> That's it, we'll play the clip here so you can... <laughs> Tums. <laughs> um, oh yeah, actually, so just as uh, a lot of these other sounds were definitely an evolution, um, one of the, I think one of the biggest evolutions in the whole movie was the evolution from the initial teaser light bikes to the new light bikes. Uh, should we just, yeah, we just, let's just play them. Yeah, here we go. So we're going to start with, this is just the sound effects yeah. of the, the light bikes. Here we go.
Jim, Jim, I hope you don't mind the new cut that we did to that. We did to What's just, that? I hope you don't mind the new cut we did to that because <laughs> we cut it down for tonight, so it's not, it's not the way it is Oops. in the movie. Forgot to tell you. So as you can see, it's not two bikes anymore. It's many more bikes. It's a much longer sequence. Um, and we wanted to make it bolder and bigger than it was before. Um, you may recognize some of the elements from the teaser, because that's definitely the basis, the starting point where we went from. But it just kind of went crazy from there. Um, we ended up making like a bunch of new elements that we could add in when we wanted to get more size. We still had sort of the whiny elements from before. We definitely had the Ducati stuff that was an element. And we kind of kept going back and forth between doing much more like the original teaser, much more of the new stuff. And I think we just ended up with a balance between the two. Um, the teaser also didn't have music in it for all the light bike stuff. So subtlety was a lot easier in the teaser. Um, in this particular case, subtlety really wasn't an option. <laughs> you wanna, you wanna, should we play with... Can I, I just want to... This is, <clears throat> I mean, for all the kind of once things are finished and it's all done, it's one thing, but this was probably the hardest mix that I've ever been involved with. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, and just that particular example of kind of where the sound, you know, this, you know Steve started with these original sounds and we went through this whole exploration, exploration over kind of a year of, of developing these light bike sounds and we kind of were in some late session and played the light bikes back and Joe was just like, it's not right. You know, he's like, can we go back and listen to what, you know, what first was done? And we went back and played that again and it was like, that was really close. And so Steve, you know, it's one of the things working with Skywalker is you've got this incredibly deep bench and they went back in a day and redesigned the I whole light bike sequence. massive credit to sequence. Kirsten Mate and Josh Gold for yes, pulling that together. Problem. Yeah, it was just amazing. And the thing, you know, just in this kind of desperate situation that you find yourself in, and they just somehow rallied and, and made it happen. One of the nice things was that we were able to kind of go down a bunch of different paths and sort of see where they took us. And it's a really a tribute to Joe and his... Um, desire to sort of experiment and to really try things out. And we tried a lot of things. And we knew that we could always go back to where we were. Um, and what it ended up being is like kind of this greatest hits of a lot of the paths that we went down. And that's why she was saying definitely props to Kirsten because uh, as the editor on the stage, she was the one that was doing so much of the juggling between the, okay, on the teaser, it's these elements. And then when we did this other pass, it was these elements. And to make them work together, we need to make a new sound for this. Um, and there was a bunch of times where I would just run up to my design room and I'd start designing something um, for a new sound or a new idea and I would shoot it down to her and she had taken it, by the time I got down there, she had taken it and done a little twist on it that changed it, that made it so much better. And then Chris would take what she had done and mix it in this other way that I had never even imagined. And I came walking in the room, I'm like, oh yeah, I did that. <laughs> but, but it was like totally different and it evolved like in this like five minute period from something that I had done upstairs to something completely different and uh, it definitely was a collaborative, uh, collaborative. And that evolution was encouraged. You know, it was, there was a, a, a sense of encouragement from everybody for all aspects of it. The, you know, the tough part too in a scene like this, we're just listening to the effects, uh, you know, stems here. And, you know, it's always frustrating in these mixes where you have beautiful music and you have beautiful effects and you put them both in and they both, you kind of end, end up with this less than the sum of the parts thing. And it's so nice to be able to just listen to a scene like this, just pure effects, because it sounds so good. And, you know, one of the tough things kind of with the, with the Daft tracks is their tracks are so big and, they, they're, and they're, they're uh, just, they tend to go on these grooves you know, and they sound great, but it was really a challenging mix to try and find ways to kind of find the balance between music and effects. It was, that was really a tough part of the mix. One thing that's cool about Daft Punk, though, is that they acknowledged it, and they they weren't all all music all the time. They knew there had to be dynamics in there, and they, they didn't, you know, they were for the film, not for the music, which was nice. Right, and this was actually one of those scenes where they specifically said, in Light Bikes, we know that we should really let the design effects kind of take precedence. We should let that happen. Um, wasn't necessarily the case for all the scenes, but for this one in particular. I said that. <laughs> 
Well, we've got we've got it to play for you. So here's the same section Ooh, again, but with everything. Again, it's, um, it's, and we'll see which one they like better. It's the cut. It's the cut down <laughs> version of it. Okay, here we go. The subs are really intense up here. <laughs> well, wait, before, before I, I have like to it. ask you about a couple things. You got to talk to them about the transformation. There's one sound in there. That's uh, like, oh, oh, yeah. What yeah, is that sound, course, Steve? <laughs> wait, can I play from the beginning? Yeah, yeah, line, yeah. The first one here. Um, so I'm going to play this for you guys right here. This is a transformation of the uh, the guy into the bike. Here we go. This is from the, the teaser. The teaser, and then I'll play the, the last one, too. But this one's kind of a little more isolated. This is where the idea starts, right, Steve? Something like that. Here we go. <laughs> Check this out. What is that? <laughs> you ever have that experience where you tell someone something and then you wish you hadn't? <laughs> <laughs> Um, that one trick. actually, you know, the, the weird thing about this too is that the early versions of the bike forming, it looked like it was a bunch of tiles kind of coming together and uh, it had this like intensity to it. And, and so I started kind of taking a bunch of sounds that sort of would convey that. But <laughs> I think the one that did sort of the best job was just flipping through a deck of cards. Here we go. Okay, so let's hear it in the let's hear it in this one too, because I think they're pretty neat here too. Because that's a lot of other stuff that's in these too, right? If you put a deck of cards in a subwoofer, it really sounds cool. <laughs> <laughs> here, but check it out with everything else. Sorry, I'm I'm kind of showing off for you guys. I just think it sounds really cool. Check this out. There's like 50 sounds in there. Yeah. And like yeah. 50 different people made them. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great, right? Oh, you know what? Show one more thing. At the, yeah. at the very end when he skids in in the teaser, yeah. that's the one I was talking about. There was that happy accident. Um, oh, right here. Right, right, right there. Down. Yeah, okay. and it's, it's a combination of, I think that's the one. Yeah. Where he, yeah, play it. Let me see if that's it. Right after this, right here. Yeah, where it goes in and does that. It's got the dive, bomb, the dive bomb, the big low end thing, which of course I love, and prime spot to put it. But it also has like thing, that thing where as the bike engine is going down, I resonated it down and it did that weird feedback thing, which was a total screw up that was really cool, so I put it in. It was an accident and it sounds Yeah, cool. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, here we go. So it's mainly that little thing right at the end of it. That's pretty great. OK, the other thing I have to ask you is just a kind of a, a Tron geek is a sound from, I recognize a sound from the original movie. Yeah, what did we decide there was? There's, um, there's in, in the shop where we talk about the, the Comic-Con Crowd H stuff, 
there's a the light up part well, of that. Well, there's this right there, here, right? And then, yeah, and there's that part oh, the, where they go the down arrows the on the track as they're yeah. going around. But, but, but that, the, what's the, the game things forming? There's a there's a, sound. a similar yeah. style of sound when he's coming up through the elevator. We have that. We can play. Yeah. So check this out. So it's crossing the arrows. Yeah, the little chevron yeah. sounds are from the original movie. <laughs> and it was actually kind of weird because in the teaser when we first started doing it, I actually, I had seen Tron, but I didn't really want to look at it. I wanted to kind of reference my memory of it since we were trying to do something updated and new. Um, and it, halfway through the process, we were talking about, like, well, maybe we should have something in from the original one. And we could only find one spot that we thought it would work, and it ended up just sort of being... It didn't really work for the teaser, but... I think everybody was sort of such a fan of the idea that we always kind of kept that in our back pocket. I don't even remember whose idea it was to put those in or who knows, know but that. there you go. And on that note, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for sharing. And if you'd like to know more, thank you. our website is mpsc.org, Motion Picture Sound Editors. Uh, we do a number of shows like this for a number of years. We have transcripts of previous shows that we've done. And uh, this was delightful. Thank you. <laughs>